I'm Lucy Shuka, and I'm based at the University of Bedfordshire and part of the International Centre and our research focus is child sexual exploitation and violence and trafficking. And today I'm going to be talking about um, the contextual dynamics of adolescent safety and vulnerability, which has um, largely come out of uh, a programme of work called the Contextual Safeguarding Programme, run by the International Centre and headed up by my colleague Carleen Furman. So a lot of this work comes from Carleen's um, thesis and then her postdoctoral work um, and is now a, a pretty hefty piece of work that we're, we're doing at the university. So although much of it is related to um, peer-on-peer -peer abuse and child sexual exploitation, it, as we go through, I'm sure you'll see um, its relevance more widely to children's services um, and child protection in its, in its broadest sense. And today what we're going to be thinking a little bit as, about is some of the, g going into a bit more detail on what I was beginning to allude to in that um, short presentation earlier, around how our system is currently established, some of the challenges with that, um, and, and what it's going to take to reform it, to align it more with the needs of safeguarding adolescents, and what steps we can take. I'll say now, in case I forget, that within the Contextual Safeguarding Programme, we have a network of practitioners that is open for anybody to join and a website contextualsafeguarding.org.uk and if you are interested I'd really encourage any of you who, who think that there is mileage in this or would like to think about applying it to your own work to go to the website and to join the network. Uh, if you do you will um, be, you'll, you'll be able to access areas of the website that people who have not given their email address do not get to see and other exciting things like that, regular blog posts and uh, it, it's a network of people that are trying to implement this into their practice so I'd encourage you to join that. Just tell us that. Con contextualsafeguarding.org.uk Or you can just Google contextual safeguarding and it will come up as well. So to give you a bit of an idea of where we're going to go, uh, we're going to start with thinking a little bit about adolescents' experiences of violence and abuse, um, an overview of um, where they experience that abuse. We're going to look at some thematic, some themes that arise from case reviews of incidences of serious youth violence and peer-on-peer -peer abuse. And then we're going to think about implications for um, child protection uh, that emerged across a series of sites uh, that were working with the Contextual Safeguarding Programme um, between, I believe, 2013 and 2016, um, and how we're beginning to move to more contextual responses. So, as I, as I suggested, this piece of work largely comes out of Carleen Furman's work, um, and you'll recognise variants of this diagram as being a kind of ecological model to how we think about children and young people as being embedded and kind of nested in a in a series of contexts that they are embodying um, and that they are inhabiting um, at the same time. So we look at the child, we look at them in the context of their home, their peer group, their school and their neighbourhood. And these are the contexts that we are uh, going to be looking at today. So where do we see um, abuse and violence um, occurring for young people within the home? Uh, incidences of domestic abuse. Um, of neglect, of abuse from or towards siblings, and of course from um, parents as well. And this is really what the child protection system is set up to deal with. But you will know, um, again, better than most, how significant the peer group is actually to experiences of abuse and violence experienced by adolescents um, in a range of different ways. Um, so you will, yeah, you will be aware of, of, of how important peer groups are when we're understanding offending and patterns of offending. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of Christine Barter's work at the University of Bristol, but um, Christine Barter's done a, a range of work around peer violence, and um, in, in one of her studies, she's she shown that for young men in, in particular, being part of an aggressive or, an, or a violent peer group is of greater significance in explaining that violence than being part of a violent family. And we know that for young people, as they get older, their peer group becomes much more influential than their family. We, we know as well that their family does not stop being incredibly influential, but the peer group becomes increasingly important. Um, uh, that's where young people are socialising, where they're spending their time. And so uh, when we're understanding intimate partner violence, um, 
Christine's work has shown that actually we, we've got to understand the associations that young people have with violent peers as driving a lot of that intimate partner violence. We, we know, we, we knew through these case reviews before, some of the bigger pieces of work that were published in the last couple of years, that schools are sites of peer violence. Um, bullying, uh, sexual harassment in corridor culture, and peer recruitment into forms of criminal and sexual exploitation. And um, we've had um, the work in Westminster and in the last couple of years, in particular shining a light on the level of sex sexual harassment in schools. And so we're doing a complementary piece of work at the moment with Ofsted and a series of sites um, across England looking at what a whole school response to peer-on-peer uh, -peer abuse and sexual harassment would look like. So if you're interested in that, um, I can give you further details later. And then finally, neighbourhood. So beyond the home, the peer group, the school, there is just the neighbourhood that you're growing up in. It's, it's um, the, your local shops, it's your local transport hubs, it's the streets around your home, and the kinds of abuse that young people experience and violence they experience there, street victimisation and robbery, harassment, and then forms of sexual violence, assault and exploitation in parks, in shopping centres, um, in local streets. And if you want, obviously, more detail, um, you can look at, look at that reference and I can give you more details in a moment. But hopefully that makes the point, in a very simple way, that there are multiple spaces outside of the home that young people are experiencing and are um, relevant to their experiences of, of abuse and violence. And we're going to unpack that as we go through. Just got three slides here that are going to bring that to life a little bit through some of the qualitative research that just indicates what it means um, for these contexts to be associated to those incidences of abuse. So this is um, a study by Ringrose a few years ago. Um, so the research, sorry, the, the young person is saying, I could be with my girls, um, and this is in school. We could just be standing anywhere in the school. I'm, I'll say that for you because I'm not sure you'll be able to see that back there, will you? Could be standing anywhere in the school, and the boys will come as they're together. They just come and then touch us up. And yeah, we'll be like, get off, get off. And they'll be like, shut up, and stuff like this. And the interview, interviewer kind of probes a bit more. So, so how long would it happen before they would get off? Because I imagine they're probably bigger. Are they bigger than you, some of them? And, and this young person says, yeah, well, people bigger than me don't do it to me, but they do it to girls in my year. And it usually goes on. It can depend on where you are. If you're in a corridor and no one is around, then it goes on longer. So on the one hand, this young person is saying, we could be standing anywhere in the school and th th these young men think that they can come up to us and that they can touch us. Um, and we can say, get off, but it won't stop them. So there are, in this young woman's experience, the whole of the school is just a site where um, sexual harassment is, is possible and anticipated and probably going to happen. And by the way, she's talking about it, fairly normalised as well. There's power imbalance there. Uh, they don't do it to me, but the bigger ones, they do it to girls in my year. And then there's spaces where if no one can see you, then actually it might get interrupted if you're in a space and a teacher walks past, if it's really visible. But if you're somewhere where you're in a corner and no one can see, then it's going to go on for longer. A study by Catch22 the next year. <coughs> Highlights, I suppose, the challenges that we may have in understanding or looking beyond the surface of what young people may present uh, in terms of what's really going on for them, what kinds of violence or abuse they are really experiencing. So in the, in the first quote, so it's like you're, you're two different people. You go outside and then you go back home. I mean, mum, mum doesn't know who you are outside. She just knows who you are when you're at home, innit? And the second, my experience of road life, I, so life on the street or just hanging around, was nothing but hell in the sense that whilst it appeared loving, protecting, cool, and the in thing to do, actually it was nothing but misery. Having to be constantly paranoid about your own safety and nothing but torture and hell. And I think that just highlights for us, uh, I suppose on one level, how unfair it is to expect parents to know um, it, all the things that are going on for young people when a lot of their experience day to day is outside of the context of home, but also how young people may present um, 
themselves and their own experience and, and not always be acknowledging entirely to themselves or to others uh, what is going on for them either. So that puts the onus back on us really to, 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 to look and understand much more uh, the symptoms of abuse and violence. And then this last example came from a study we conducted into gang-associated sexual exploitation. And this was a young, well, a young male who's an adult, but reflecting on, on when he was younger. Um, I've done it to kids before. I've been saying, go in there, what's up with him? Here's a girl, you know what I'm saying. I, I'm finished, so you can go in. And he's like, I'll go in there in a minute. And then you notice him, like you see in their eyes that they don't want to go in. And when I first, like, beat a girl and that, and beat means to have sex, um, I got, like, not peer pressure, but it was like, that was how I ever lost mine, in it. And there are a number of things I think are really interesting in this particular um, excerpt from an interview with this young person. Uh, the context of abuse is, is the peer group. There is some sense of being initiated into your sexual experience in the context of older males probably looking up to, but also probably intimidated by. Um, the older male sung, saying to the younger male, like, I've done this, it's your turn, I'm finished, what's wrong with you? Um, a, the power imbalance there. And what's clear from this is that the, the young male doesn't want to, and the older male knows that the younger male doesn't want to. How this may have appeared um, in a case file, or if it's told from the young woman's perspective, may not have surfaced what was going on for that young man. But in that situation, it certainly appears as if neither the young male who is committing that, um, that assault or the young female are consenting. Neither of them are consenting. There is um, exploitation, pressure and power imbalance at work with the young male and the young female. And certainly that's a theme that emerged in that gang's research in multiple ways. So where we saw incidences of lineups in uh, local parks where you'd have a series of young males and young women expected to give them oral sex along the line. Um, for the young man who's just told to line up and stand in the middle, number three of six or seven, um, how easy is it to say no? Um, what kinds of pressure are there to take part in that, even if you might... So we see the kind of victim-perpetrator distinctions beginning to collapse. That's where I'm going with, with all of that stuff. Um, and it invites us, of course, to look beyond uh, what's, what's happening to the social and the peer context and how power is at work in those spaces. So I'm just going to share some of the themes that are arriving from, from, arising from a series of case reviews and uh, three studies in particular. The first was um, in-depth case reviews of nine different cases of very serious youth violence, rapes and, rapes and murders um, committed by young people against their peers. Uh, the second was a further eight case files, um, more varied, so, so uh, still cases of of assault, physical and sexual violence, but um, at the less extreme end, um, harmful sexual behavior online, offline, domestic violence and CSE. And then the third study also included um, the victimization, sexual victimization of a young man, which we hadn't had in the previous case files. And although we've had in these, in these case reviews a range of different um, forms of harm, severity of harm, the themes are consistent across all of these case file reviews. And one of the major themes um, is that we see, time and time again, uh, responses from agencies that are individualized, that focus um, either mainly on just one perpetrator or on one victim, and don't make the connections between different young people. So we have issue-specific uh, agency uh, meetings, protocols, and so that's what I was referring to earlier. We might have a uh, a risk assessment for CSE or a risk assessment for gangs or a panel for trafficking, but these are all happen happening separated from each other, information's not being effectively <coughs> shared, um, and we have duplicating and replicating processes that are not well aligned. And we're not looking at the contexts that are sitting underneath the, these incidences that we're looking at. We saw um, isolated assessment of and response to capacity to parents. We're going to go into that in a bit more detail in a moment. But rather than assessing uh, the capacity of a much broader range of institutions who, who may have responsibility for the safety of children and young people, the focus in these case file reviews was almost solely on 
what are the parents doing? How do we assess their capacity to, to, to pr protect? And everything flowing in terms of actions from those judgments. When we did see intervention, it rarely addressed context. And so what happened, of course, was that risk persisted. Uh, we, you may have found a, a, ring a ringleader being removed, but um, we, we heard the example from, from the officer just in that, in that previous uh, presentation that if uh, you remove, you cut the head off an org organization or serious crime, um, or even a, a gang, uh, you, it doesn't mean that the problem's gone away. We have um, victim vacuums where even if you uh, support one young person, if they are removed from a context of harm, if that context isn't addressed, more young people are recruited to take that victim's place and there are more young people in a culture that hasn't been challenged to continue to offend as well. Individual case management. So young people live their lives socially, as we all do, in friendship groups, in peer groups, in all those contexts that are essentially social in which um, their day-to-day -day experiences are out, you know, they're outworking themselves in relationships. Someone else was there when the ex assault happened. Someone sent a text sharing that image with six other people. Um, the person who, over, who walked past at, at the time that the assault was happening and didn't say anything but witnessed it. All of these things are happening, and yet generally in these case files, in, in these case file reviews, it was only individual case management, and people never connected the, uh, the young people who were involved in these incidences. And that means, and that meant, that often the, the interventions that were used were relied heavily on relocation and movement. Managed move between schools and relocation of witnesses or children in care out of the area. So if we look at capacity to parent, a couple of um, quotes here from case files that I suppose just challenge the logic of assessing capacity to parent. Mother stated that there were things going on in Sarah's world that she did not have access to. She described that Sarah was being controlled by others who were more powerful than her mother. And then the second quote, Sean's mother had reported that her son's behavior was out of control a year before the incident that was referred to in this case file. Sean's mother had called the police to report her son missing, stating that she was struggling to manage his behavior and that he was returning home with unexplained amounts of money and would pack a bag and stay with friends. So our child protection processes, our statutory tools to safeguard children and young people from harm are based on an assessment of how capable parents are to safeguard children and young people. But what we see from these incidences and what we see really from that, that diagram that shows the context in which this harm is actually occurring, parents are being held to account for things that are entirely often beyond their control that they don't, not, they don't necessarily know about in environments that they have no control over, people that they have no knowledge of or no access to. And yet, when they sit in child protection meetings, the question is, can you control your child? What is your capacity to safeguard? And certainly another piece of research I just completed that was a, an evaluation of uh, the charity Parents Against Child Sexual Exploitation, PACE, I don't know if you've come across them, um, there was a consistent theme that parents were being blamed for the sexual exploitation of their children. Um, that it was assumed that they had the power to stop it um, and where parents were not empowered, where they weren't supported, where they weren't, where information was not shared with them, actually it created a really vicious circle in which they, their trust of services began to reduce, they shared less information with services, they had less access to emotional support through services and all of that actually ends up making the home a less safe environment than it was in the first place, which makes even fewer safe spaces for a child. So, so coming in with a, the assessment of parents in the first instance is, is, uh, is not just illogical because of the forms of harm teenagers are experiencing, but it also really undermines the potential for the home to be a safe place sometimes. Okay. So individual assessment and intervention versus contextual risk. So some of the examples across these three um, studies, these case reviews, we saw a range of interventions that focused on doing something to or with the individual. It might have been the, the offender. Um, it was often the victim. Even though the problem or the risk was enabled by a range of contexts that were persistently showing up, this problematic peer group, this particular location in the park, um, this school, that 
never seems to deal effectively with cases of sexual assault on the property. Um, so we saw um, safety planning, mentoring, one-to-one -one support, counselling, education, secure placements, training. Uh, in study one, contextual risk was addressed by the management of individuals. So some restrictions were placed on contact between suspects um, and complainants to try to address risk within peer groups, but we'll see in a minute how uh, that often did not work and was not effective. In eight cases, young people were moved to different schools, and we know that when young people are moved, they often interpret that as, as, as in some way that they were to blame, because they're the, ones who, they're the ones that get disrupted, they're the ones who have to leave their friendship groups and the, the space that they knew for their own physical safety, but nevertheless, um, it's them that, that has to move to a safe place. And in four rape cases and two murder cases, uh, neighbourhood relocation of witnesses and or, and or complainants. And so in terms of relocation and managed moves, G1, so this is uh, one of the young people from this case file review, was in imminent and serious danger um, in current circumstances, required removal from social and home environment. Um, it doesn't appear that there was any uh, conversation or even questioning that it might be possible to disrupt this um, abuse without having to disrupt this young person. A move must be facilitated so that the family can leave the local area and avoid all possible threats and recriminations. And across 20 cases, relocation or managed moves were used as follows. In study one, six local authority relocations, eight managed moves. In study two, three relocations and two managed moves. In study three, one relocation and one managed move. In study four, oh, study four, interesting. One relocation and, and managed move in both cases. And in, in, in a different piece of work um, that I conducted around specialist foster care and CSE, uh, one of the key findings from that was that safety was being interpreted to be physical primarily and disruption and removal, relocation, was a mechanism of achieving physical safety. But for young people who, like all of us, are embedded in relational worlds, safety has a relational dimension. Um, if you are moved 200 miles north and placed in a residential unit up in Lancashire and you're from London, uh, you're sense of relational security is incredibly undermined. You're put in a new school, you are put into a new home, you have to make new relationships, you don't have access to the worker who you'd built trust up for the last two years with. Um, everything has changed for you. You feel lonely, you feel vulnerable. Those sound like the kinds of experiences that someone might exploit. So we actually see in the case files of um, young people who've experienced chronic instability in care placements, increased vulnerability to further exploitation because they are moved multiple times for their own physical safety with no assessment or understanding or real care given to how that undermines their relational safety or indeed their psychological safety, that being another dimension. If you are traumatised and you've experienced sexual assault, do you ever feel safe? You may be in a physically safe place, but until you really have support and therapeutic work to help you um, integrate some of that experience, you are probably going to, going to be continuing to um, live out of a place of feeling profoundly insecure, and we don't really take account of that. So, another example from a case file. Following the sexual assault on school premises, the complainant stays away from school for two weeks. Upon her return, she's kept away from suspects prior to charge. Following charge, attempts are made to keep all suspects out of school, but this cannot be implemented, so bail conditions forbid contact between all suspects. The complainant is physically, insulted in, physically assaulted in school by other students in a bid to get her to withdraw her statement, and as a result, she moves and leaves the school before the trial commences. Following the trial, two of the suspects are incarcerated. No changes are made to the school environment during this time. I don't think there is any doubt that these are incredibly complex, difficult cases, um, or that um, it would have been possible even to have protected that child in that situation. But the fact that nobody even seemed to address the fact that the school was a site of um, ongoing risk and, and assault for this young person, or addressing the risk as she went back to school, is really problematic. Uh, this young person stayed away from school for two weeks, and that seems incredibly sensible. Um, in this incident, uh, in, we th I think we're seeing an example of truancy as, as safety work. Um, the young person taking it upon herself to keep herself safe by, by staying out of school, because it's school that is the site of danger for her. 
It is not a safe place, and that clearly bears out as you see what happens when she goes back to school. She, when she went back to school, the interventions that were available to her in the school were mentoring, a healthy relationship program, and at, at one point she lashed out at her mentor and um, she was given a fixed term exclusion. Again, examples of individualised interventions that do not look at the peer group, that do not look at the context, don't look at the school culture at all. And so if we leave these contexts unchallenged or unchanged, or if we don't assess or intervene in any way, that risk just continues to persist. So in another case, B10 was threatened online by multiple individuals following the service of papers to the defendants. 8G4 was punched in the face by a girl in her school year for spreading rumours. And that was in the case of a murder. She was a friend of a complainant. Since the convictions and relocation, 5G1 has been raped on repeated occasions since, continues to go missing, has sustained physical injuries, is associated with others who use drugs and weapons, according to police reports. FG1 went missing from foster care. When uh, sorry, 5G1 returned, she disclosed that her and her friends had gone to a party with some boys. The next day, another boy arrived and asked if she wanted to celebrate her birthday by having sex with him. She said no, but he vaginally raped her anyway. She did not stop him, as this is something that happens in the gang culture that she mixes with. 5G1 has refused to cooperate with police. You wonder why. <clears throat> it speaks of the realities of re-victimisation, but also the very serious need to anticipate re-victimisation, because we know the research, and to develop much more meaningful approaches to assessing and anticipating ongoing risk and doing something about it. So what are some, some of the implications for child protection in particular? We've begun to talk about this already. Um, our child protection system really has been designed to intervene to protect children from risk in the home. Um, but what happens when children need to be protected from risk outside of the home? We don't really have the tools, we don't have the processes, we don't really have the paperwork, we don't really have a system that works well for that. Cases rarely meet thresholds for social care intervention, and that's often because the home is assessed to be a safe place. There's nothing wrong with the parents' capacity to safeguard. There is no risk in the home, all the risk is outside of the home. Um, and so if you don't, those cases, there might be absolutely cases of really significant harm, but they don't wish to reach those thresholds for social care intervention and parents are told to take control and no action is taken. So what do we need to do? We need to turn this around, rather than thinking about assessing parental, to capacity, to, parental capacity to safeguard, uh, we need to flip that logic and we need to think, well, if the spaces in which young people experience these, these forms of violence and abuse are outside the home, then we need to assess the capacity of those who have some kind of responsibility for those spaces to safeguard children and young people. We need to think about who is observing or interacting with those peer groups. Um, we need to think about school and we need to think about neighbourhood. Whose capacity shall we assess and in which space? And actually, which space is impacting on which services capacity to safeguard? So if you have a fantastic intervention with a young person uh, that you have designed um, and you're trying to do all this work with them to talk about um, what it means to, have, have a, be, to be in a healthy relationship, to talk about consent, to talk about violence, to challenge some of what they may have witnessed, but they are um, night after night witnessing domestic violence in the home, you know that that's always going to be a challenge. How are you going to achieve this kind of change? It's going to be a struggle. It's not impossible, but it's going to be difficult. The same logic applies. If they are going into a school environment in which low-level or serious sexual harassment is tolerated, is not effectively dealt with, that is going to undermine your capacity to work with that young person and safeguard them. So an example of how we can apply this kind of logic, we, do people work with genograms much? Taking, yeah, taking the, the concept of using a genogram to map a child's significant relationships and the significant experiences in their life. Um, you won't be able to see this, but this is a, a, a map of a peer group. Um, this young person in the middle uh, is made a disclosure of a rape. Actually, there were a series of disclosures disclosure she made. She mentioned all of the young people and the young adults and the adults who are in this map 
in her disclosure, but she was the only one who received any kind of intervention. Nobody else was worked with, even though all of these people were very closely associated to the assault that she suffered. Um, they were present when she was raped or when she was punched or when her friend was assaulted. Um, they, um, they associated with the other people who were ultimately charged. And this was all mapped from a case file review, but no work was done with any of them. Um, and so, again, I think actually youth, youth justice probably is uh, a space where this happens much more readily than it does in places like social care. Um, and so if you do use this kind of peer mapping tools regularly, please do advocate for them to be used with other colleagues that you work with. Other examples of ways that we can more proactively safeguard um, that uh, either we have seen examples of, of good practice or came out of um, some of these case file, case file reviews, investment in analytical mapping and trend identification. So um, it's that kind of mapping, it's getting together and looking at is there a, is there a context that is, is associated with the forms of risk these people are experiencing. Awareness raising with local businesses and public spaces. We've seen a lot more of this work in the last few years, whether it's been training taxi drivers and making them the kind of eyes and ears of the local community, or whether it's about uh, uh, doing awareness raising with local businesses. Geospatial mapping and multi-issue hotspot mapping. Again, we, 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 we're doing that much more with CSE uh, around locations, but not necessarily across multiple forms of risk. So still more work we can do there. It should be obvious, but detached youth work has a clear role to play here. Neighbourhood teams, housing and youth service providers, uh, those who are, whose day-to-day -day work geographically is in those spaces that become associated are context where abuse and violence is happening. Bedding and clothing seizure. Um, again, we, we know that where young people maybe are, afraid, are afraid to disclose, don't want to talk. We have seen instances where victimless prosecutions can be achieved by um, uh, DNA or uh, taking forensic material without a young person having to testify or even make a statement. Situational prevention strategies. We see that logic around um, street lighting, uh, making spaces safer. We don't necessarily always do that with spaces that are associated with ongoing risk to children and young people. And then use of disruption and civil orders as well. Okay. So contextual safeguarding, we think, has about four different domains. Uh, and this comes from the report from the Misunderstood Programme of Work, from which a lot of this has, has kind of come out. Um, and that report's available on the University of Bedfordshire International <laughs> Centre website, as well as the Contextual Safeguarding website. Domain one is about targeting, preventing, identifying, assessing, and intervening with the social conditions of abuse. Domain two is about our legis legislative framework incorporating extra-familial context into traditional child protection and safeguarding frameworks. And we're really right at the very edge of beginning to do that uh, now. And if you are responding to the consultation on, on um, working together, uh, and that's something you would, you'd be interested in incorporating any of this, please do come and talk to me afterwards. Domain three, partnerships. Developing partnerships with sectors or individuals who are responsible for the nature of extra-familial context. And then domain four, outcomes measurement. Um, all of our outcomes really are focused on individuals. We don't know how to measure outcomes very well with contexts. We, we don't say, is this school more safe than it was a year ago? Is this alleyway more safe than it was a year ago? Is this peer group uh, more, more functional than it was a year ago? But there's no reason why we shouldn't. And I imagine many of you would be working or could be working around domain one and three, but I think that what we're looking at is a whole programme of work that is beginning to shift some of the culture of our child protection systems in these ways. One-to-one -one interventions are obviously going to continue to always be significant and important. Um, so all of this is not to say that we don't need to continue to work individually, one-on-one -on -one with young people. Um, you won't be able to see this at all, but in, the impact of extra familial risk on children and, uh, uh, children and families needs to be worked with. So we need to work with emotional, physical and mental well-being, involvement in offending, going missing, all of these things. Um, and we need to do those in ways that take account of the family, that rebuild family relationships, re-engagement in education, things like that. I think what we're saying is those interventions 
ideally should be happening alongside other interventions that are trying to transform the context that you are working in one-to-one -one, so that there is synergy between different levels of intervention rather than one-to-one -one intervention happening in a wider context that continues to just enable um, forms of, of, of violence and abuse. So we had a serious case review in Kingston recently where two young people sustained um, serious physical um, injuries in their local community and the case review said professionals followed all relevant pr procedures. They didn't do anything wrong as such but they just never connected these two young people's plans together even though that harm that they suffered always happened when they were together. Okay. So what about contextual examples? So some of the um, examples we've identified during um, audits, reclaiming vulnerable contexts, using data to identify environments where young people are being groomed. So um, in one example, we knew that uh, a shopping centre was being, young people were being targeted in this shopping centre. Uh, so specialist workers, social workers, police visited that shopping centre regularly. And over time, it just makes it a less... Uh, a, a less functional space for anybody who wants to groom because there are adults there actively looking out for young people, looking out for their safety, uh, making that a space where it is less possible to operate if you are there targeting young people. Um, young people expect to see them there, begin to talk to them, and it begins to become a safer space. Protecting vulnerable homes. So homes being identified, identified where peer-on-peer -peer abuse is occurring. Um, in this particular incident, we had a home that was lived in by a mother with physical and learning disabilities. And the lighting and the CCTV was improved around this home. Um, there was engagement with the family by a schools officer. The peer group were engaged that were using this home through youth service and policing. And as a result, the home is no longer used um, for abuse. And then thirdly, peer group mapping, assessment and intervention. So social workers, youth offending workers, identifying the links between individual cases, meeting to map, refine their assessment of, uh, of these young people and designing complementary interventions um, that are creating synergy and working across um, individuals. So one quite practical thing we can do, even if, even if many of this, much of this might feel that it's beyond us really to, to transform practice, to look at context, um, and, and much of it may be, but we, what we can do is we can identify language that individualises and we can try to incorporate alternative language. Um, so you will recognise many of these as being problematic. Um, she's promiscuous, he's manipulative, he's streetwise, she's making risky choices. That's risky behaviour, she's an absconder, he's sexually aware, he's aggressive, she's out of control. She's a liar, that's just boys being boys, um, seeking glamour, will not engage. And that language where we see it in case files, I think um, drives us towards certain patterns of thinking which prevents us from asking questions that flip that logic and think about whose responsibility it might be to, a, to make the spaces that children and young people are in safer. So. We, for that young person who was out of school for two weeks, um, that was not, that certainly wasn't a risky choice. Being out of school was a sensible choice to keep herself safe. Um, and potentially for some young people who really don't feel safe in their local communities, becoming gang affiliated, although described as a risky choice, you know, and we would understand why. Um, it may be a choice that makes sense. Even if we don't, even if we would challenge the idea of rational choices, they're not illogical choices. They're choices that make sense in, a, in, a, in an environment where you feel that you need to be protected. Um, so we might change that from making, making choices that make sense to try to keep themselves safe streetwise. Or we could say he's doing his best to make it in an unsafe environment or will not engage. Um, we haven't been able to engage him or we haven't yet given her a good enough reason to engage with us. So I just want to end with um, a few resources that if you're interested you could, you could look at. The first is a briefing on the role of youth funding teams um, in cases of peer-on-peer -peer abuse. And again, this is at the Contextual Safeguarding uh, Network website.
We've also got uh, a briefing called Incorporating Context into Assessment. And this might be quite practically useful. So there's an example from that, um, from that paper here called the Contextual Intervention Plan. And this was designed working with um, Asset Plus to um, en enable you to think and map and ask yourself a series of questions that would um, just extend assessment beyond the individual, their family, to their peer group, to the locations that they're part of, um, and to begin to create intervention plans that respond to those contexts too. And then lastly, uh, an assessment tool for assessing harmful sexual behaviour, again, that takes account of context in these ways. Do look at the website if that would be helpful, and my email's there as well. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments um, before we go back to the main session. Yeah, yeah. So we can see it from an adult perspective mm -hmm. and we struggle to take part of it. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I think what you're describing <laughs> sounds very familiar. Um, I would like to see maybe next year, you know, the county lines and this, because this is a foundation for county lines. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think. We really need to, to, to come together. Absolutely. Yes, and I, I mean, I think that's what, what I was trying to allude to earlier. I think there is. There is a sense, increasingly, I think, of it is not going to work to have these separate tracks, these separate labels for forms of harm, separate processes, um, because, well, firstly, because young people experience multiple forms of overlapping harm themselves, and we're, and we're not going to, uh, it would be, it would just, it would be nonsensical, really, to, to try to separate all of those out systemically um, when, young people are experiencing them in a joint in a joined up way it's just their life um, so it's it's it feels like we're moving towards that and there we are seeing experimentation around um, moving away from those single issue responses to for example adolescent at risk panels how many people have seen it in their local authority any kind of move towards this so vulnerable adolescents a couple of hands going up yeah yeah quite a few actually um, Try, beginning to try to address that. Um, but, but I think your other point around how do we, how do we move to a, a world where we have a much closer understanding of the reality of what's happening to young people when they don't, when they don't necessarily tell us what is happening. And I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I think one of the challenges is that we often don't really make the time to listen.
Yeah. Yeah, so, so a, a de-escalation of kind of risk when the, there's no evidence that anything has got less risky, it's just that a child won't say anything more. I mean, I think we've, we've got plenty of evidence of why young people don't disclose and why they don't necessarily trust or engage. And so I do, I do think it partly comes back to where then are those spaces where services are building relationships, trusting relationships with young people, where there is no pressure to disclose, but the, the paradox, of course, is not just with voluntary sector, but the voluntary sector are particularly well placed to do it. If you do not have to engage, that creates the context in which you're more likely to engage. If you have to engage, <laughs> immediately barriers are up. So deploying the voluntary sector to, to build those kinds of trusting relationships, not to force disclosures, but to begin to um, allow some of that information to come through, I think uh, is one part of that, um, and, and really advocating for the role of those services. Are there any other comments or thoughts? I'm not sure, quite sure where we are time-wise. It might be time to go. Yeah. 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 It is, and 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 there is no downward pressure on anybody to to behave in these ways because actually, of course, if you do, what you're doing is is um is saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to take responsibility for something that is potentially not really my responsibility. <laughs> they're probably so you know, busy enough doing what they're doing. The idea of pushing back to partners to say, I, well, I'm going to create a partnership where we are going to look at these contexts and we are going to do something to, uh, together about this. Um, people, people are doing that, but they are doing that outside of the system. The system is not encouraging or incentivizing any of that kind of partnership work necessarily. Uh, but I mean, there are some, I would say, to look at those last three examples uh, of resources I gave, because there are a series of questions there that professionals can be asking um, in a youth, youth offending context around some of this. So what's the role of the young person you're assessing within a peer group? To what extent is a peer group of concern being impacted by or responding to risk in other social environments like the school? If a young person is being supported by a youth offending pr practitioner, can partner agencies intervene with other environments that are informing the nature of the peer group, detached youth workers, neighbourhood policing? And it's that kind of just pushing the thinking outward and outward and outward and asking the questions that take in those wider contexts that um, I think we can do. And some of those questions are there for you to take away if you want to. Anything else? 
Are we at time? Yes. Um, so I think this one in particular, incorporating context into assessments. Um, so that is in particular about using peer group information capture forms in ASSET Plus. So that would be particularly relevant. Um, and also this briefing on the role of youth offending services um, in building local responses to peer on peer abuse. And they're all at the contextual safeguarding website. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you.